A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers is a captivating non-fiction travel book penned by Henry David Thoreau, originally published in the mid-19th century and later reprinted in 2004 by Princeton University Press. It chronicles Thoreau's expedition alongside his brother from Massachusetts to New Hampshire and back. The book stands out for its distinctive structure, layered narrative, and evocative symbolism. Notably, it also challenges conventional Christian institutions, a remarkable stance for its time. Thoreau, renowned as a philosopher, made significant contributions to the fields of natural history and modern environmentalism. Organized into chapters for each day of the journey, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers contains meticulous and factual accounts of the day's events. However, Thoreau weaves these episodes with religious, historical, and poetic tangents. He cherishes a simple existence and harbors disdain for transformative changes brought about by the Industrial Revolution. The book commences with a touching tribute to Thoreau's brother, who tragically passed away before its completion. Thoreau composed this work while residing at Walden Pond following his brother's demise. Struggling to find a publisher, he resorted to self-publishing, which plunged him into debt. The final version of the book was eventually published posthumously. Thoreau embarks on his narrative by delving into the Grass Ground River, referred to as Concord by the New England settlers. He laments the transient nature of its name, which morphs depending on the inhabitants and their objectives. Thus, nothing remains constant. For instance, older civilizations recognized the river as the Grass Ground River due to its significance for hunting, but such purity can never be reclaimed. Thoreau's depictions of the river exude poetic charm, often romanticizing stretches that remain untouched while contrasting them with segments altered by settlers. Thoreau's expedition commences on a Saturday in August 1939, as he and his brother drop anchor in a nearby harbor. Being natives of the area, their descriptions are imbued with meticulous detail. They traverse past notable landmarks such as the pivotal battleground of the American Revolution and the North Bridge, linking these historical sites to political discussions. Thoreau dedicates several paragraphs to vividly portraying the diverse fish and wildlife encountered during their journey. The boat sails alongside the tranquil village of Bilrica, which Thoreau regards as a positive testament to humanity's inherent attraction to peaceful and simple living. He perceives the Industrial Revolution as an aberration, contradicting our natural instincts. Thoreau comprehends the reluctance of Native Americans and ancient civilizations to adopt such lifestyles. He critically reflects on the inauthenticity of organized religion and its institutions, highlighting their discordance with nature. Thoreau observes that many individuals selectively adhere to religious teachings, acting in accordance only when it suits them. He also notes that churches, which embody these institutions, often stand as the ugliest structures in any village, for it is within their walls that people commit the gravest sins of deceit and hypocrisy. Thoreau mourns the erosion of one of the greatest art forms, poetry, caused by religious establishments and industrialization. Perhaps that is why his travel accounts abound with excessive poetic flair. As the boat navigates the river, Thoreau reflects on various battles fought along its banks, providing detailed descriptions of injuries sustained by soldiers. For instance, he encounters a man with a musket ball lodged inside him, his right hand severed, yet considers this to be a relatively minor affliction compared to others endured. Thoreau gathers many of these stories during overnight stays at different anchorages along the way, he firmly believes in following one's conscience, advocating adherence to God's rules rather than those created by humans. Thoreau firmly believes that God has bestowed upon us the earth and the means to sustain ourselves. He advocates choosing a way of life that embraces this natural order, rejecting the artificiality and industrialization of society's pursuit of efficiency and uniformity. While he recognizes the purity and emphasis on individual and collective conscience in Christianity, Thoreau holds reservations towards the institutions that propagate it. Additionally, Thoreau bemoans the limited perspectives of European writers, noting their tendency to look inward and rely solely on their immediate surroundings for inspiration. He contends that this narrow focus disregards the richness of great writings and teachings from diverse nations and continents. On the other hand, he commends Americans for their pursuit of cultural diversity and their avoidance of the insular nature exhibited by European writers who assume to speak for everyone. As Thoreau approaches the conclusion of his account, 
He expresses delight in revisiting childhood haunts and witnessing their thriving condition. He observes how nature impeccably preserves itself, while it is humankind who often disrupts and alters what was never meant to be changed. This philosophy also resonates in Thoreau's depiction of the riverbanks as he retraces his journey back home. He acknowledges the ever-changing skies and waters, recognizing this as an essential aspect of natural order. From this perspective, travelers always have something new to observe and write about, if only they know where to direct their gaze. I hope you enjoyed this video, leave a like if you did, and be sure to subscribe thank you.